yeah, let's start. A very warm welcome to everyone on this beautiful Wednesday evening. At least it's one here in Dortmund, Germany, uh, to another event of My Europe. Um, it's My Europe Norway today. Um, My Europe is a digital event organized by several settlements of Europe Direct and takes place every fourth Wednesday of the month. Um, yeah, uh, the, there's a, a quick advertisement um, at this point um, for our next event. It will be the 22nd of June, um, so not uh, no um, event the next month but um, the month after. Um, yeah, um, about the event, we are always pleased to welcome guests from the respective countries that are covered. Those wonderful guests are then introducing us to their culture and freely setting their focuses, often on a topic of the heart. Today is no exception, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. Before, a quick shout out to our partners. Um, I try to get to the next, yeah, there it is. Um, the um, My Europe Aachen and Dortmund, as well as Duisburg, Essen, Gütersloh, and East Belgium. Also the AEGEE -E Aachen, the Institut Francais Aachen. <laughs> Sorry for my um, for my um, pronunciation, and uh, the well-known Karlspreis Stiftung. Um, the event won't be your usual monologue, but it's an interactive exchange. Uh, in the beginning, we'll have uh, Kahoot. Our guests will expand on that later. Um, please type your questions during the talk that you have in the Q&A tool in Zoom uh, on the edge of your screen. Um, I will do my best to organically insert these questions in our guests' talk. Speaking of our guests, um, it's quite funny. Like a month ago, we once again have someone on our hands who is not actually a citizen of the European Union himself. Then it was Fabian Kuhn from Switzerland. Today, it will be someone from Norway. Um, unlike the former, Norway came close to joining the European Union two times, but rejected accession in 1972 and 1994 in referendums. Uh, nevertheless, the country is very closely linked to the EU, not only because of its geographical location, but also through its membership in the European Free Trade Association and its participation in the Schengen area. To add, since 1960, they had much success in the Eurovision Song Contest. Well, they won three times uh, compared to Germany's two times, so they were fairly successful. Um, we are very happy to have Knut André Sande with us here today. The 25-year-old is a truly European Norwegian. He was active for several years in the Norwegian Pro-European Youth Association, excuse my pronunciation, Europeisk Ungdom, um, which campaigns for a united Europe. At the moment, he is a board member of the European organization JEF Europe and lives and studies in Oslo. Knut will give us his perspective of the, I quote, complicated relationship between EU and Norway. Could or should Norway become an EU member after all? Besides, Knut will give us valuable insights about a Norwegian way of life and the country's special characteristics. My name is Henry Schlund, and at this point, I would like to give the floor to Knut André Sande. Knut, welcome. Thank you very much, Henry. It's uh, great to be here. And uh, I can also say that speaking from Oslo, the weather is also perfect outside. So it's also sunny here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about something I love talking about, and that is Europe and also um, how Norway um, are dealing, is dealing with Europe. So I will start my presentation. Um, and then if you have questions, you can, I think, write them to Henry uh, underway and yeah, feel free with, to come with your questions. So my working title, can you see the presentation? It seems like that, okay. is Norway and the EU. And I have said it's a complicated relationship status. Um, first of all, a few more things about uh, me. I'm from Sandnes in Norway. It's on the southwest coast. So if you ever come to Norway, you should go there because we have beaches, we have mountains. It's very nice in fjords. I'm currently a student and I've been the president of um, Europeisk Ungdom, as Henry said perfectly uh, a minute ago, uh, for four years. And Europeisk Ungdom is also the Norwegian 
section of Jeff Europe. So Jeff is the Young European Federalists. Um, even though Europäisk Gründam is not a federalist organization, Jeff is, of course. Um, so it's about uniting Europe. And besides this, I love traveling, hiking, and swimming. And here you can see me hiking, of course, with the EU flag on a perfect location, uh, because uh, this is how you show people that Norway is also Europe. But I have an agenda set up for today. First of all, get to know Norway with the Kahoot, um, with a short, uh, short introduction to Norway. And then I'm challenging all of you who is uh, following this uh, webinar to guess the answers. Maybe you know some of the answers already. So it will be kind of a competition. And then a part two about the Norwegian way of life before we go over to Norway and the European Union and this complicated relationship. And of course, there are very many things that could have been said on this theme. It's a huge theme, so I cannot say everything. So I will leave that for the questions. So if you want more information about something, just ask and I will give more details. Um, I hope you're familiar with Kahoot from before. If not, um, you will get a short introduction right now. Kahoot is a Norwegian company and they have online quizzes you can do. So what I want is that all of you go into the website kahoot.it from your phones or maybe also computers. Uh, and there you will get a code so you can sign into this particular online quiz. Um, so I hope you can all see um, the code. Uh, 3869017. Oh, so I will give you some time to find it. So here you just choose the name you want to have. Um, and then you will get further instructions of how this will work in a moment. And I hope that everyone wants to join because it's a lot of fun. Um, you don't have to use your real name. You can also use a nickname or a fake name or whatever. And then there is some Kahoot music. Perfect. As we all know it. <laughs> So I'm very curious if my questions are difficult or if they're quite easy. So we'll see in a moment. You might also all be very talented. I know there is room for a few more people. So yeah, we'll start soon. Okay, then I think we will soon start up because I can't see anyone more joining. Um, yeah, last minute. Okay, so we start in five seconds. There we're going. So name the quiz, get to know Norway. And the part one is about history and geography. And this is a picture from Lofoten in the north where I went on summer holiday last year. And um, you should all go there if you go to Norway. So remember that. First of all is which country is Norway? Where is it located? And then you have to answer the correct color. I'm glad you all knew that question. Then there is no need to further explain where we are in the European map. <laughs> and it's also about being the fastest. So Nijnhorn was fastest on the first one and is in the lead. Does Norway share a border with Russia? True or false? We actually do in the north. And um, a fun fact is that 
um, Norway, accordingly, is the only neighboring country that Russia has not ever invited, invaded, um, except from when we were freed after World War II, of course. Um, yeah, but it, it's not that long, but we have a border and Sweden does not to Russia in the north. And most of you knew that. How many people live in Norway? In this game, it's actually not forbidden to use Google, but you will spend more time, so less points. And the answer is 5.5 million, so we're on the same size as I think almost the EU, uh, not the average, but when it comes to all the countries after each other. A medium-sized European country. And Einhorn is still in the lead. And then a question, who is Norwegian head of state? And here's a picture of him. Do, you have, do we have a president, a monarch? Something else? Nothing? <laughs> it was a trick question, but it was easier than it seemed. So Norway is a kingdom with a monarch and we have no complicated structure. And then we're half the way. When was Norway first united into one kingdom? Around which year? It's actually around 880. And uh, it's so long ago, but it also tells us that Norway is quite an old country when it comes to the borders we have and the nation, the Norwegian nation is quite old. Um, and um, contrary to many other European countries, the Norwegian borders have been almost the same during the whole time. And who is the prime minister of Norway? I can say that we got a new prime minister this autumn, and it's a social democrat. And of course, it's the person in the picture, it's Jonas Gastore. Uh, Jens is the, yeah, well done, Henry. <laughs> Jens is the secretary general of NATO for some more time, and Torbjörn Dagland has been the president of the Council of Europe. And Anna Solberg was the former one, but she's not anymore. But you seem to do very well so far. Um, yes, I think everyone does that. When were the Norwegian referendums on EU membership? This has been mentioned a few times already. Quite good. 72 and 94. So it's almost 30 years since the last one or the latest one. Um, Nineholm is in the lead with a good lead. I think uh, all correct so far. But now we go over to the part two that I call the Norwegian way of life because I want you also to, if you go to Norway, how is it? Is there anything you should know before going? Um, so let's see. And the first question is, you're in Norway, someone says ha to you. What does it mean in English? If I say ha. The answer is, what did you say? 
in my, very often we don't say a lot of words, so we can say it in only one short word, a whole sentence. So ha is an example of that. Um, but um, yeah, you all guessed a long sentence, so you understood that this was a trick question. And Neinhorn is still in lead, and then German Dane, and 11. Or how do you say 11 in German, Henry? You say elf. Elf, of course. Like like the one with, with the ears. Ah, uh, yeah, Iceland have some of those. You want to buy a bottle of wine, where do you go? Do you go to the supermarket, the drugstore, the gas station, or the wine monopoly? It is the wine monopoly, you all knew that. So you cannot buy it anywhere else. And remember, it closes six in weekdays and three in, on Saturdays. So you have to be there early. And Sundays, nothing is open. Two more Kahoot questions. You enter a local bus, it's half full. Where do you sit? Anywhere, it depends on your ticket. You're polite and sit next to someone, or you make sure that you do not sit next to anyone. Of course, you should never sit next to anyone. That's rule number one. You need to give Norwegians their privacy. They need their private sphere around them. So do not sit next to them and do not start to speak to them because they will maybe politely just say like, yeah, they don't really want to speak to you. It's not to be rude, it's just part of Norwegian culture. Um, yeah, it could also depend on your ticket some places, but it's not that normal that your ticket tells you which seat you have. And then the final question, you're hiking in the mountains. What do you say to random people you meet along the way? Nothing. You smile and say hi. You say something about the weather or you start the conversation. Yes, in the mountains you can smile and say hi to people, but not on the street in a city. So you have to go outside of the city into the forest and then you can start to say hi. But you should not start having a conversation because that's too much. And if you are to say something more than hi, it's about the weather usually. Norwegians always talk about the weather. Um, so if you meet some Norwegians, you can just talk about the weather if you don't know what to say. But I think you all did very great. Um, you're all ready to go to Norway and stay here for some time. If you want to, you're all welcome. And uh, the winner this time with 11 out of 11 is Nineholm. Well done. Let's give Nineholm an, a warm applause. That was some tricky questions. I was historically bad. Uh, I think I got 11th, so elfed. <laughs> you were elf or you was on the 11th place? I were on the 11th place, yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, I think this is a good start. And uh, now we have warmed up and then we will go over to the Norwegian EU stuff and some history. But I, I think this was good. And I mean it. I don't yeah, say it just. It was great fun. Yeah. I always already saw in the chats the people had had uh, had fun. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, then we go over to the main part of this presentation now that we have warmed up, and of course I also forgot to mention why I am such a huge fan of Europe and everything with it. And I'm not sure what really woke up my engagement, but about 10 years ago, when I was 16, I just realized that we needed to fight for the Europe we want because we saw populists everywhere. In Norway, there has been a very strong anti-EU movement. 
and it was maybe particularly strong about 2015, 2016. Um, and I wanted to work for an alternative to all of this, to work for improving the EU instead of just saying no to everything that wasn't perfect. So that's why I started it. And then I met so many great people all across Europe and also in Europe uh, who works for the same and it's difficult to do anything else. So um, yeah, I just love it. And it's so important to also to bring the knowledge out to people because uh, most people don't know much. I'm not sure how that is in Germany, but if you ask Norwegians how many member states are there in the EU, they might answer five or 50. They have no idea who is the president of the EU or can you mention one of the presidents? No idea. Um, and that's why we need more knowledge so people understand how it functions. Yes. Over to a short historical background, and this will not be a whole history lesson. Um, as I mentioned, Norway is a quite old nation. Um, and then for many years, Norway was one nation. But then in 1397, Norway came into the Kalmar Union, a union consisting of the countries you can see purple on this picture, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, actually parts of Germany or Schleswig Holstein, I guess, um, Greenland and Iceland, and the Faroe Islands and some more islands. And this union lasted for a long time until Sweden managed to get out. And then Norway continued in a personal union with Denmark for 300 years until 1814. So for many, many years, Norway wasn't an independent sovereign uh, state. Uh, we were under our neighboring countries. And then in 1814, Denmark had to hand Norway over uh, due to the Kiel Treaty uh, because they were on Napoleon's side in the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, we could go over to Sweden and be in the union with them instead. And uh, this was great because we tried to start a war with them and uh, we got a constitution, uh, even though we were in a union with Sweden. So Norway had a quite liberal and uh, radical constitution in 1814, inspired by the French um, constitution and the American one. So it's one of the oldest constitutions of today because we still have it, um, one of the oldest constitutions in the world. Um, and then finally in 1905, we got our independence from Sweden. And um, yeah. We were later occupied by Nazi Germany, but only for a few years, and then we've been independent ever since 1945. Um, in 45, we were one of the founding nations of the United Nations, and the first Secretary General of the United Nations, where he was Norwegian, Trygvili. So that's quite cool. And we were also founder or co-founder of uh, NATO. So Norway has been quite active on the international stage from quite early after the war. But Europe, no, we were not that interested there, or maybe. Because Norway was not one of the founding countries of the European Union or its predecessors, European Stalin, coal and steel um, community. Uh, but in, the 19, in 1960, Norway was one of the founding um, countries of European Free Trade um, Agreement or EFTA. Um, with the UK, among others. And uh, during the 1960s, and not many people know this, Norway actually applied for membership in the EU uh, twice, uh, together with the United Kingdom. But France and Charles de Gaulle said, no, we don't want the United Kingdom to become a member. And then Norway didn't become a member either. So it's actually Charles de Gaulle's fault that Norway is not a member of the EU today. Um, and then a few years later in 69, Norway discovered oil. And this was the start of the oil, the Norwegian oil adventure, where we found a lot of oil and gas. And of course, Norway has benefited a lot from this uh, due to all the oil and gas we have and the high prices and um, all the income we have gotten as a result of this. So it started in 69 and then it has just continued and we have produced more and more and earned more and more money. And then in the 70s, we had our first referendum. And um, 
it was a clear majority, but it was quite close. So it was 53% against 47% pro membership. And here you can see a picture um, um, of a huge um, street action um, out close to the government headquarters uh, in Oslo. Um, but this is by the no to the EU movement. So you can see that from early on, they managed to get a lot of people, a movement of people out in the streets to fight against EU membership or EEC membership at this time. Um, instead, when Norway said no, we managed to get a trade agreement uh, with the EEC. And this trade deal we have still today, um, it's about uh, lower customs on uh, industrial products etc. So it still exists, but it's not really that important anymore because we have uh, supplemented with a lot of new trade deals after that time. Um, in the 80s, the six EFTA states and 12 EU um, states started to negotiate the EEA agreement. And I'm not sure if you're that familiar with the EEA agreement or the European Economic Area, but in short, well, I tried to put up a map to explain it. So you have to understand Europe, 1980, 1988, 89, divided into two, East and West. Um, so in the West, you have the yellow states, uh, the EU or um, EEC countries. And then in the East, you have the Soviet Union and its satellite states and states under Soviet influence. And then you have the dark blue states to Maybe you could call them more neutral in all of this. They weren't really neutral, but they couldn't go into the EU because then they were afraid that, okay, we could get problems with the East if we go into the EU. So you had Denmark, no, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Austria, Switzerland, Iceland. And they also wanted to be part of the new single market that the EU was inventing, but they couldn't because they were not members. And then Jacques Delors in France uh, tried to find a solution to this by uh, creating a single market consisting of the EU member states, but also EFTA states who wanted to join. So this was a, an opening for countries such as Norway to actually be part of it. But what happened was that during these negotiations, when you had six countries towards 12, uh, the Berlin Wall fell, and then many of these countries could actually apply for EU membership because they weren't afraid to do it anymore because the Soviet Union wasn't that threatening anymore. So uh, Sweden, Finland, Austria all applied for membership in the EU. And then Norway realized that we also have to apply because otherwise we will be the last country not applying and not being a member of the EU. So um, we applied and we had a referendum in 1994, but before that, the EEA agreement was uh, signed because the EU and EFTA had decided that, okay, this is a deal we can, um, we have negotiated, we agree on this. Uh, so it was signed in 92 and then it went into force in 94 before the Norwegian referendum. So we already had the EEA when we voted on the EU. And then before the referendum, because it was quite late in 94, we also had the Winter Olympics. And just think of that, you have a lot of Norwegians winning the most medals in the Olympics, and you have a lot of nationalism and people are so happy and they think that, okay, Norway is the best thing that ever happened. We don't need the EU. So this might be some of the explanation why Norwegians said no in the second referendum. Um, but also we already had a very good trade agreement. Our companies were basically part of the single market, um, even though we said no to the EU because we already had the EEA. So we didn't have that much to lose by actually saying no to the EU in the second referendum. And then some of the main arguments from the movement against the EU in 94 was that EU was too capitalistic. Um, it didn't care about environment. Uh, it was only for rich countries in the West. Um, you would move power from people to institutions far away, etc. You might have heard some of these arguments from Eurosceptic um, parties, but also some of it is legitim legitim legitimate uh, EU critic. Um, so that was back in 94. 
and it was quite close, 52% against 48. So it could maybe have gone the other way, but unfortunately it didn't. Um, A quick second. Uh, yes. Um, you just named the arguments against the EU membership in 94. What was mm. in contrast to um, 72? What was, was it a similar situation or um, in 72, could you expand on the arguments against the um, membership mm. then? Well, I'm not that familiar with the arguments from 72, it's too far back, but I know that um, in 94, um, the European communities had become the European Union. It seemed to have more power than it had in 72. So it was more people thought that, oh no, we don't know what we go into. Now it's becoming a union and then maybe they will just take more and more power from us. So it wasn't only about what the European Union was in 94, but what it would probably become in the future. Uh, so I think that is a main difference. Um, and also, I don't think environment was that important in 72 because they didn't talk that much about environment back in 72. But in 94, uh, you had Kyoto, you had different things. So it was actually coming up as uh, a more important theme. Um, and then I forgot also mentioning that, um, or I mentioned that we had the single market coming up in 94. So this was different from the trade agreement in 72. But Norway had an exception on uh, agriculture and fisheries. Uh, and it was very important for Norwegians to uh, make sure that our fisheries and our farmers didn't have competition from European countries. So um, that was also a main argument. And I don't think it was that important in 72. OK, mm. thank you very much. Yeah, and then the Norwegian political parties basically meant the same in 72 and in 94. So if they were against in 72, they were also against in 94 and the opposite. Um, and then just to mention the Norwegian Social Democrats, the Norwegian Conservatives, um, and actually the Progress Party a bit right wing were the most pro-EU parties. And then the rest were basically against the EU, including the Liberal Party or, yeah. Um, the Christian conservatives, um, the communists, the socialists, and the farmers party, which has held a lot of power in Norway for a long time. Um, so it was a bit like the elites against the people in this referendum, where you had all the newspapers, you had the biggest political parties pro membership, and then the people against membership. Uh, or that is how it what it seems like for many ordinary people. Um, last thing to mention here is that both in 72 and in 94, you had a lot of people voting. I think more than 90% of the population actually voted. So the turnout was great. And that also makes these referendums more legitimate. So yeah, that's, um, yes. Just what you just said. Um, how come the progressive party, the right wing party was pro EU? Cla the, the classic thing in the EU is, um, I, I don't know if you take Hungary, uh, for example, the right wing uh, is very strong and it's very anti EU. Um, what is the difference to, to Norway? Well, this was back in 94. And then the progress party thought that the EU is um, a free market mm -hmm. and uh, they were very against regulations and very pro free markets. So that's why they were pro in 94, but they have later changed their view and now they're against membership. Ah, okay, very yes. interesting. Thank yeah. you. Yes, and then um, of course I could say something about the 2000s and 2010s, but I want to try to summarize it in this uh, slide about Norway and the EU today. Um, because here is an overview about what of most of what we do. Um, we are a part of the EEA, the European Economic Area. Uh, as you can see, it consists of the yellow states here and the blue states. So you have the EU in yellow and the blue is um, the EEA countries. And then you also have Switzerland, another EFTA country, but they said no to the EEA. So they don't have the same trade deal as Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein has. 
Um, so Norway is like the big boss with Iceland and Liechtenstein are super small. <laughs> yes. And then, yeah, the United Kingdom left this market. Um, and this deal gives Norway full access to the single market, except from fisheries and agriculture. And the deal also says that Norway has to implement the new rules coming from the EU because the rules are always changing. And for Norway to follow the same rules as the rest of Europe, we need to adopt the new rules all the time. So this trade agreement is quite different from most trade agreements because it's dynamic. It's always changing. You can't just keep it. You have to update it all the time. Norway has also been part of Schengen for many years, I think since the beginning or since almost the beginning. Um, and some of the reason for this is that um, before Schengen, Norway had open borders with Sweden, Finland, Denmark, the other Scandinavian Nordic countries. And when these countries wanted to become a part of Schengen, Norway, of course, didn't want a new border to Sweden. So we had to become a member of Schengen. And uh, I don't think the EU actually liked this because Norway was not a member state, um, but they accepted it because nobody wanted to set up a long border. You can see on this map how long the border actually is between Norway and Sweden and Finland. Um, so Norway is a Schengen country. Um, we're a part of most EU programs because Norway is like, oh, we want to work with uh, the EU on this. So we become part of this program. So we're part of Horizon on um, science. Uh, we're part on Erasmus, uh, Europol, Eurojust, and the list is very long. And when the EU comes up with a new initiative, we usually join that one too, because we see that this is good for us. So to actually not being a member state, we are the most integrated non-EU country in the EU. And for example, on defense, uh, Denmark has an opt out, but Norway has decided to join PESCO and other defense uh, corporations in the EU. So it's a bit weird that we actually work more closely to the EU on these um, areas than, for example, some EU member states. And then, even though we follow EU law, we don't have the EU courts because we cannot uh, follow the courts of an organization we're not a part of. So instead we have an EFTA court and EFTA institutions kind of mirroring the EU institutions. Uh, so there are some EFTA parliamentarians, but, but usually we don't pay any attention to it. Nobody has heard about it, but it exists to make a structure where Norway can actually part, be part of this without breaching our own constitution. Um, and then it's what we do not do. Fisheries and agriculture is not a part of the EEA, as I already mentioned, meaning that Norway can say that, okay, um, our farmers shall have more subsidies. Um, we have uh, high custom taxes on cheese from the EU. If we buy a cheese from Europe, the price might be the triple in Norway because we don't want competition from European farmers. And um, yeah, so this is to make it easier for Norwegian farmers to have um, a better economy, et cetera. Not that they really have it. A lot of farmers close down every year. Um, but on this, we also follow some EU rules. For example, on animal rights, we have to implement a lot of EU rules when it comes to farming. So uh, we're part of a bit of this also. Um, we're not a part of the customs union. So that's a bit interesting. So on the border, you will have to do customs checks. And for example, on alcohol, you can only bring four bottles of wine into Norway and not more. Um, and then we're not part of the euro and we don't have any representation. We do not have any democratic influence in the EU institutions. Um, so I think that's the main difference. And that's the most important thing you will actually get by becoming a member of the EU. You will sit there, you will have an influence, you will be able to speak and to vote and everything. Back in 2012, there was a government report trying to find out how is Norway's relationship to the EU. And they concluded that Norway was 75% member of the EU in 2012 uh, because of all the regulations we had implemented more than 12,000 EU regulations and directives, and that's like almost all the <laughs> directives. 
Um, and every year we're implementing more and more of them. So usually the EU decides, oh, we want a new directive. And then they, um, it's decided in the council and the parliament in the EU. And then they just send it over to Norway and we're like, okay, we will considering just doing the same. So we're not actually um, getting the laws through the EU. We just cope with them and implement them. So it's weird, but it has been working so far. Um, but this also means that every year democratic def deficit will be growing in Norway because less and less power will actually be in Norway because we don't decide stuff. We just follow the rules. Um, Knut, you just named uh, the perks and disadvantages of not being an EU member for Norway. Um, uh, one question from the audience was, uh, did Norway accept refugees in 2015 when we had this big uh, wave of refugees and um, the EU had to send them yeah, similarly um, over its membership um, countries? Um, did did Norway have to um, accept refugees or did uh, didn't even arrive? Well, I think we had to, or we were supposed to, because as a Schengen member, we also have to follow Dublin and Dublin too, and the, the, the rules there. So the borders to Greece, Greece has to Turkey, is also kind of the Norwegian border because it's, yeah, our common border. So I think the Norwegian government said that we will take some refugees if other countries do it. And then I think eventually we actually relocated a few of them, but not very many. Um, and it, yeah, and how is it with the Ukrainian refugees? Are you seeing um, yeah, a spike in, in refugees that are coming to Norway or? Mm, yes, yeah, so far I think we have about 16,000. So it's actually a lot compared to how many refugees we have taken in the past. I think during the refugee crisis in 2015, we took 30,000 at the most, but then many were sent back, I think. Um, and this is only in a month, two months. Um, so it will probably increase. Uh, but the Norwegian government has just said they're all welcome here, but they have also been criticized for doing everything really slow. So during the whole Ukraine conflict, the EU decides something. And then a few weeks later, Norway just decides the same. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. And then just not a fun fact, but a fact about the migration crisis in 2015 is that a lot of uh, mig migrants and refugees actually also came directly over the Norwegian border from Russia because Russia um, sent them through Russia up to the Norwegian border in the north and sent them over the border on a bike because you're not allowed to walk there, but you can use a bike. So I think five or 6,000 refugees actually came in the north and then Norway realized that, oh, we need to build a wall. So we built a small wall and then it was too close to Russia. So we had to rebuild it, <laughs> so it was really stupid. Um, yeah, but we're a Schengen country. So we are basically mostly like other Schengen countries in the EU. Um, and then I just wanted to mention that um, Norway today has most of the Uh, good things about the EU. We have most of the benefits uh, because we're a part of the single market. We follow the rules. We have free movement of goods, people, capital, um, and services. Um, so it's very easy for us to trade. And um, I can also say this from my experience because uh, as a member of Europeas Kingdom, We visited a lot of different, um, here you can see some pictures, different um, industries and Norwegian companies. Um, on the first picture, you, you can see uh, outside in the fjords, in the sea, uh, fisheries, uh, selling seafood to Europe. And then you have uh, uh, some industry producing steel and aluminium. You have uh, recycling of batteries and you have power production. And almost, I think every section, it, uh, every sector of Norway is selling something to Europe or dependent on Europe. So it's really important for us to be part of this. Um, and that's also one of the main debates right now on the EU, because Norway has started to export a lot of energy to the EU because there is an energy crisis. But Norway is used to very low energy prices. Uh, so maybe like five cents, uh, four cents, 
per um, I don't know how you do this in uh, in Europe, but per per hour, five cents per hour, and then maybe now it's maybe ten times as much, and it's still not exp as expensive as maybe in Germany. But for us, we believe it's very expensive because we're not used to it. So people are really angry at the EU right now for this, even though it's not the EU's fault. So typical. Um, yeah. I'm about to finish up, but some uh, last words. It's a complicated relationship. On the left side here, you can see a building. It's a building next to the European Commission in Brussels, and it's called Norway House. Because the way Norway actually has a say is by a lot of lobbying in Brussels. So let's say after the German car manufacturing industry, Norway is the biggest lobbyist in Brussels because that's the only way we can actually be heard. And it's a joke, but also a bit true that if you're a Norwegian diplomat, you are doing a good job if you're really fat, because that means you have a lot of meals with EU politicians and you pay for it, of course, but they give you information back. Uh, so if you have lunch and dinner with EU diplomats, then you do a good job. That's how we do. And on the other side, you can see EVS-Avtale, meaning the EEA agreement. And you can see how Norway we believe that we decide our path, but we actually just follow the EU all the time. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's um, a good picture of how it's actually working. Um, what is a bit interesting is that even though the EEA agreement is almost a membership of the EU, um, and it's not really democratic, most Norwegians support it. And Norwegians have been asked for the five, past five years, do you support the EEA, AOS, or are you against it? And you can see a clear majority, 60% actually increasing. Now it's almost 70% say yes to the EEA and no to leaving the EEA. So they want to keep it, even though it's not democratic. And this way you can actually say that it's kind of democratic because we decided to be part of it, but yeah. But when you ask them if they want to become a member of the EU, they're much more negative because I don't think they really understand the difference on the EEA and the EU. They think it's a huge difference, but in reality, it's not much difference. So here you can see the polls dating back to 2000. After the financial crisis around 2010, Norwegians got much more negative to the EU. You can see in red. Um, and then it has taken eight years, 10 years, and support has increased a bit to about 30 percent and this was before the war now i think it's a bit higher than that but uh, we're still far away from having a majority pro membership in the eu and this is because norwegians are afraid that we will lose our oil and gas and money by becoming an eu member which is not true but there are a lot of um, false information in the norwegian debate so the question is if it's increasing right now and I think we see that it's increasing right now. Um, and it's, it's also possible to have a majority pro-membership. You see back in 2004, 2005, in blue, there was a majority pro-membership. Unfortunately, there was not um, a referendum. <laughs> so it is possible to have a majority Norway pro-membership. So at last, I said I was going to say a few thoughts of the future. And what is clear is that the EU right now is more important than ever. A lot of things have changed since 1994. On, for example, environment, you see that the EU is more important than ever, both in Europe, but also on the global stage. And Norway is actually just following the EU on climate rules, etc. So that was an argument against the 94, but now it's a good argument pro EU membership. So it's changing. Also in fisheries, the EU is more important than before. Um, and when it comes to only rich countries being in the EU, then why cannot Norway, which is even richer, <laughs> become a part of it uh, when EU has opened up for a lot of countries in the European East? So what we see is that it's time to debate Europe. It's starting up. More and more newspapers are writing about it. Um, and more parties are actually discussing it. And then I had to also add this picture. It was in a newspaper yesterday in Norway. And um, you have someone, some Norwegians, of course, in a boat again, like the last picture. But here they say, it's tradition that we do this. And that's why we should continue doing it and not have a discussion. 
and it just doesn't make sense. But that is basically what the movement against EU say right now, that we don't need a new referendum because we just have it as it is today. Um, and things are moving. The Norwegian Liberal Party changed from no to yes uh, last year um, to the EU, and that is, that is a huge, huge change. And uh, one minute before this presentation started, I also saw this headline uh, at the Norwegian Broadcasting where the Greens say that they want to have Norway into the EU and they ask the party to change their view in the, um, their um, Congress next week and to work for a Norwegian referendum on the EU. So, so things are moving. I'm not saying that there will be a membership this year or next year, but it's actually becoming realistic in the future. And um, it wasn't a few years ago. And I definitely think that we should join because right now we follow the rules, but we have no say. Um, and we should become an equal part on the European stage. Yeah, so I think that's my um, presentation. And then I'm open for questions and comments. Yeah, we indeed uh, have some questions. Um, maybe uh, because we were just at that topic, Martin asked how likely is that Norway will ever join the EU? I think you expanded on that a bit. Um, yeah, but I could also add something because a few years ago, uh, the European Youth of Norway had, we asked our members, do you think that Norway will ever become a member of the EU? And when do you think that will happen? And then you ask young people who fight for Norwegian membership. Yes, and some yes. of them said never. <laughs> and these are 16 years old and really want a membership. <laughs> but uh, now it's becoming more likely. And I would say, I think something will happen between the next five and 10 years, maybe before because of this war. Uh, but the debate is moving. And um, a lot has changed during 30 years. Okay. What does need to happen to have another referendum? Do you need like the political support the the parties mm. that they have to decide yeah we'll we'll have a referendum yes there has basically always been a political majority uh, pro membership but they don't have a referendum every year because they don't want to have it until they actually can win sure. um so i think the norwegian government or prime minister will just have to wait for this to be possible and then the prime minister will say that I want a new debate. This is what happened back in 72 and 94. It was a prime minister or the government who took the initiative to uh, actually uh, sending in an EU application and then have the debate when you have negotiated this membership. Uh, right now, it's a bit difficult because the Social Democrats are in government with the Centre Party, which is the Farmers Party and the most anti-EU party. So if they go for a new debate, the government will just uh, be crushed. It will not work anymore. So I think the Social Democrats do not want a new discussion right yeah. now. I understand. Yeah, the next question is uh, a general question about Norway, um, about the population distribution. Um, do Norwegians um, mainly live in big cities or are they spread around the country? Um, like all European countries who have had a lot of centralization. So right now, most of them live in bigger cities. Around a third, I think, of the population lives close to Oslo in the area around. And then most of the people will live along the coastline. Um, the north has had problems with a lot of people leaving that part of the country for many years. Um, so that's um, a problem. Um, and then you also have smaller villages being that people leave because they go for the bigger cities. So this also is up for debate um, because we want for people to live everywhere in the country. And for some reason, people don't want that because they want to live in a bigger city. Yeah. Do you think it's a movement from younger people that want to have opportunities in the big cities when you have maybe um, education or, or shopping or something? Or is yeah, it, is it that's still... part of the pattern that young people move into the cities and especially young girls because they go for higher education and then they don't go back afterwards. Um, but now with digitalization and we build more infrastructure, then maybe it will become easier to live a bit outside the city. So I, I, know, I know a lot of young people also moving back, but I still think more people are moving into the cities for the moment. 
Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, another question was, someone in the audience had the feeling that Scandinavian countries are further ahead than other European countries in terms of environmental and climate protection. Um, mm. At least Sweden, they said. Um, do you see that um, for Norway too? Um, is, is Norway really ecological? Is there, um, yeah, do, do the government, does the government um, set a, a big um, importance to that? I think for many years we were in front, but now it's changing due to, again, uh, the European Green Deal uh, and everything the EU does right now. But also you have EU programs like Natura 2000 on um, protecting nature. And Norway is not part of this. We decided that this is the one thing we actually decided not to be part of. Um, and the current government is opening up for um, more highways, uh, meaning that you will have uh, to destroy nature uh, and also to build more along the coast, um, close to the sea and uh, rivers. So we used to be good at it, maybe not anymore. I think Norway was for for many years a big exporter of uh, of oil. Mm. Um, right now we have the Ukrainian war. Um, does Norway benefit from the fact that European countries like Germany want to become independent of Russian oil? Is that the uh, yeah in in the media is that present? Yes, it's present. Again, what is more present is um, energy and energy prices due to exporting. But uh, Norway has never earned more money than we do right now. And Norway is a rich country from before. And now I think the government realized that, okay, we will get uh, extra income of uh, 100 um, billion euros only this year because of oil and gas prices. So Norway definitely benefits a lot because when prices are higher, we can sell the same gas for higher prices. So we sell everything we can right now and we will continue doing that but uh, there are some Norwegian parties like the Greens who say that Norway is actually profiting on the war right now due to these energy prices we should give some money back to Europe or to Ukraine but I don't think it's going to happen. Okay the next one is a very personal question um, for you Knut. Uh, do you identify more as a Norwegian or as a European? <laughs> um But I don't think it's that difficult to, to, to answer. I identify most as a Norwegian and then as a European. Um, and then, or unfortunately, I think that most Norwegians don't really identify as Europeans at all. Um, but Europe is very important to me. So I would prefer not to choose. Yeah, um, I think uh, you inspired some people um, because someone asked, how can someone migrate from... Uh, from Norway to Turkey. I, I don't know if, if it's the right... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. You want to migrate from Norway to Turkey? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe from Turkey to Norway? That seems more sensible to me. Yeah, then I guess you need a working permit or a student permit or something, just like the rest of the Schengen area. Yeah. Um, because as a Norwegian, you can move anywhere in the European Union, but uh, not outside. And as a Turkish citizen, if you're a Turkish citizen, you can maybe not move to the European Union. Yeah. Unless you have a job. Yeah, a question about the culture. Um, someone visited Oslo many years ago, around 2010, and uh, they had the impression that the city was very gray, many concrete buildings. Um, do you think it's, it's still that way or has it become greener, at least in the big cities? Well, I think uh, Oslo has become greener. I, I live in Oslo and I was really skeptical before moving here because it's the biggest city of Norway and the only like really big city. But it's not very far from where I live to the forest uh, or the fjord. So it's only a few kilometers and I, so you have these green lungs going through. So when you know where they are, it's great to be here. But if you're in the city center and don't know that, then it can feel very gray. And we have spent so much money lately on new buildings and they're not looking good. They're all gray and white and light gray and really boring. 
So I can understand that in these new areas of the city, it's not very nice. And also in the areas from like the 70s, 80s, it's very great, like the communist side. Um, but it's also getting better. Uh, they have built a lot of like promenade, uh, promenade next mm -hmm. to the fjord and a new opera. And um, parts of Oslo is really nice. So if you have the chance to go here, you definitely should because it's so nice. Yeah. Uh, Martin asked, how uh, should we envision the poor Norway before the oil boom and uh, historic question? <laughs> Could you just repeat? Yeah. Um, what was Norway before they uh, mm. found oil? <laughs> the yes, well, poor Norway. Some Norwegians or many Norwegians think that we were really poor and like the poorest country in Europe. That is not true. Norway was not the richest country of Europe and we're not today either, but we were like a normal, maybe a bit richer country based on per capita because there are really few people up here. Uh, but we had a lot of income from uh, uh, lumber, from fish, uh, from exporting industrial goods. Um, and also we had really cheap uh, energy because of our, our hydro power plants. Um, so we produced a lot of things that we exported to Europe. We were a big in industry nation. So we had a lot of income. Um, and even today, we don't, we produce all our energy with hydro power plants and windmills. We don't use any oil and gas ourselves. We just sell it to Europe and we don't use it. Yeah. Um, another question about uh, history. Um, how do you evaluate how Norway is dealing with its history with the Sami culture, with the Sami people? Mm, yeah, I didn't mention this during my lecture, but um, we have this, um, what is it called, um, indigenous people, uh, mostly in the north of Norway, and they also move over to, or th this group is also in Sweden and Finland and a bit of Russia. Um, I think for very many years, Norway did terrible with them because we, they had to learn Norwegian and forget their culture and That's why there are not many of them left. But now it has become much better during the past years. And you have not only symbolic things like road signs in Sami, but also politicians have said that they're sorry for what we have done to them. So it's getting better. I think it could still be even better, but um, the respect is much higher now than it was before. Okay, thank you. Um, Martin asks uh, another personal question. What do you study in Oslo? Because uh, he <laughs> also is going to study in Oslo and maybe uh, you have some tips for him. Oh, that's great. I study law. Um, so I'm not sure what I will write my master's about yet, but maybe something with Europe. And then I also have, I didn't mention, but a part-time job at the Norwegian Data Protection Agency because we also follow GDPR rules. So... Um, Yeah, it's basically the same in Norway as in Germany. So yeah. maybe something with privacy. Ah, okay. Um, we don't And welcome, Martin, when you come here. <laughs> yeah. Get in touch with me. I, th I think he will. Uh, I'm, I think he had five or so questions from, 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 from him. Um, a question from, from myself. Um, what is... You, you didn't expand too much on on the culture in terms of art and music and mm. yeah the vibe of young people um maybe you could um tell tell something about this um yes i think there are many things that could have been said um well on art if you come to oslo we have a lot of new museums just opening up including the munk museum edward munk a very famous painter um, so I think that would be great. Uh, but also when it comes to artists, um, there are several very famous young Norwegian talents. You have Kigo, uh, you might have heard of, uh, or Girl in Red, um, and other young Norwegians. So I think we do really well there right now. Maybe not in the Eurovisions. You mentioned that we have three victories, and we have, but we have also the most uh, zero points and uh, the most last places oh, so uh, in the competition ever. <laughs> yeah, that's frustrating. <laughs> it's a bit funny. No, so um, I think it's really great. And um, yeah, I don't know what to say about music. We have 
young artist. And also, if you just come to Norway, you will uh, understand that it's uh, nice to be here. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, another question that just came to my mind. Um, is there um, a Scandinavian nationalism? Because uh, in, the, in the SC, uh, European Song Contest, you I, I have the feeling the Scandinavian countries always give 12 points to, to themselves yes. or the neighbors. <laughs> um, but but also in, in other aspects, um, I have a feeling, I mean, the flags are similar, so <laughs> maybe uh, maybe they, that's one more thing. Um, but is there a, yeah, a feeling of, uh, of a, I don't know, being, being one region? <laughs> I, I don't really think so. We say that for Nordic people, if we meet other Europeans, for example, in Jeff, when I meet other people, I will maybe be with the Nordics and we have our Nordic meetings, but uh, nothing much more than that. And I think also in Norway, we're a bit afraid of unions, both the European Union, but also uh, being like in a Nordic Union because of our history being under different countries. But we have to understand that those unions in the history was different than the European Union, where we're actually an equal partner. So um, I don't think there is any real Scandinavian or Nordic identity. There are some people wanting a Nordic Union because, oh, we don't need a European one, we need a Nordic one. And then, okay, but these neighboring countries are already in the EU. So yeah. how are you going to solve that? No, we don't know. They just have to leave first. Mm. Yeah, uh, thank you. I don't think there are any more questions to answer from the audience. Um, no, nothing is coming. Um, so I will thank you, Knut, uh, for your insights. It was really lovely talking to you. And uh, I think everyone had really much fun with the Kahoot. Um, <laughs> and as, uh, yeah, I, I myself, um, yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to Norway uh, in the next years or so. Um, and um, yeah, I think um, we'll see, you are, you are invited. Um, we'll see together, uh, we, we'll see us again in two months um, on the 22nd of June, uh, when we will talk about Belgium. Um, Yeah, I think uh, I wish everyone uh, a very good evening and um, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, everyone. It was great being here. <laughs>